So, welcome back to the Drawing Table Podcast, everyone, where we have chill and casual conversations about art and, of course, creating as well. I am one of your hosts, Jordan Tuffin. And I'm Kendar Madi. And today we have a very special guest, and we're really excited to have him uh, on the podcast to talk about design, world building, and also production stuff. And. Our guest for today is Eduardo Gonzalez. Eduardo has been an over a decade long veteran in the games industry. He studied at Art Center College of Design before becoming a concept artist at Sony. He started out on God of War and moving on to other big titles such as Killzone, Twisted Metal, and All Stars Battle Royale. Most, not- most notably, he headed Riot Games' visual development team for their extremely popular MOBA PC title, League of Legends, and also he co-founded their world-building project. He currently works as the art director at Super Evil Mega Core, working on Project Spellfire. And as usual, uh, we will close the episode with a dedicated Q&A session. And yeah, without further ado... Uh, Let's welcome Eduardo. Hello, everybody. All right, there we go. All right, I think thank you're you. now on the screen. Ed. Cool. <laughs> thank you for those kind words. Yeah. That was a great intro. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> felt like we kind of... <laughs> yeah, we really and, appreciate yeah. having Anyways. you on, man. It's good to be here. Yeah. <laughs> So I think, awesome, yeah. So I think we can actually just take things from the top. And one of the reasons why I'm so excited to have you here on the podcast with us, Ed, is because of your wealth of experience. Most of our previous guests that we've had are, I guess you could say, relatively new to the industry. But mm-hmm. I think with the amount of experience that you've had, uh, there's going to be a lot of things that we can learn from you. Oh, I, I hope I can help in any way possible. And just, uh, I, you know, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with Ken and, and, and really just I'm always kind of looking at ways to kind of um, help and move the industry, at least from the art side uh, forward. That's good to hear. Man. So I think um, we want to, I guess we want to start on how you get started in the industry because I'm sure it's been a while, but um, <laughs> yeah. How how did you first get oh, started? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Take us like, how did back you to your childhood. First, know about <laughs> concept art. I, I don't know if we yeah. want to go back that far, but uh, you know, I, sure. I I think I've always kind of just known that I was going to be an artist. Um, always just kind of like uh, competed with my brothers and sisters in terms of like, you know, uh, the attention of my parents through art and say, hey, look at mine. Says, Who's is better? And of course parents always tell you everybody's just great and they're all equal um, <laughs> Everyone's a <good> <laughs> the difference is I just never stopped and it was just part of me at at some point I just never looked back and and, and just said this is what I I want to do um, and so worked mm-hmm. really hard um, and somehow ended up at Art Center um, it was a big dream of mine to go to that go to Art Center but at the same time it was super expensive so I found I found a way to kind of get to Art Center um, and I, and I think I'm still the only person that's gotten a full scholarship from art center. So I, I, I you know, there's a, there's a, oh, wow. there's wow. a deep story there. Um, but, uh, in essence, I, I think for four years, I kept doing a portfolio and then saying, can I get in now? And they're like, yes, you can get in. It's like, can I get in for free? <laughs> and they're like, no, we don't do that. Um, and so I just, every six months <laughs> I re-entered the portfolio and I think I wore them down. And they finally wow. just said, yes, you can get it <laughs> and, uh, and we'll get in. So that uh, that was a short story uh, version of that. But, uh, you know, those four years were extremely difficult. And I had many mentors, uh, Disney Imagineering, uh, Tom Tharston. Uh, there's, there's a lot of people that I just kept bugging and try to get them to really help me develop a portfolio that was just killer enough to get the first scholarship ever at art center um so i wouldn't just take no for an answer and uh, and it paid off um and then you know also oh, you were in contact wow. with those guys even before you made it into art center uh i was in contact with them and they were running for their lives away from me so i i, I was 
I was bugging the heck out of them. Um, and I, 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 I probably owe a lot of them apologies for, for, for doing all sorts of crazy things to try and get their attention and just get their advice, um, you know, and stuff like that. Mm. So I would apply knowing that I, there's no way in hell that I was going to ever get that job, but just so that I can get feedback. Um, and back then, and yes, that, that, that ages me, but back then uh, it was like a physical portfolio. So you had to show up, you had to go and ask for somebody that wasn't expecting mm -hmm. you and hopefully they're there and, and, and then just look at your work right in front of you. And they're just like, Oh, Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well you need, you need some <laughs> extra work and they're being super nice about it. But, uh, eventually some of them started saying, I need, you need, you need a lot of help. Let me help you. Um, and that's kind of what so I was looking for. So how did you manage to not get discouraged though, through all of that constant rejection and even maybe comments that you didn't exactly want to hear maybe in terms of about your work? Oh, I never let it be precious. If somebody said it was terrible, I would, I would, I would actually would love that they said that. I, I know that it wasn't good enough because it wasn't good enough to get that scholarship. Mm, so anybody that says it sucks, I'll be like, why? Uh, what would make it not suck? And, um, and so I really <laughs> had to put that behind my head, behind in the back of my head. But like, honestly, it's about eagles and you can either have one or you don't. And, and back then I was just, I was too desperate to get into art center to have an ego like that. And it, it, and it would have gotten my way. And so I, that was that, but there was a lot of moments where I thought I was never going to get in. And those are the hard ones to get over. And so sometimes there was times where like, I, I give up and, and thank goodness that I didn't, but, mm -hmm. um, many times I almost gave up. And you, the, the problem is, is that your brain is designed to convince you out of things that are just, you know, like you convince mm -hmm. yourself out of things um, all the time. And that's why things don't get done. Um, I had to fight through all that. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it was, it was not easy and it was really difficult, but I finally, when it, when I got it, um, oh my God, I cried like a little baby. Um, it was like the best <laughs> day of my life, four years of hard work and bugging people. And just like, it was, it was a lot of energy that was released at that moment. So positive, beautiful energy. And so it was, wow. it was great. And that's why you kind of, I always got addicted to that. I'm like, I want to do something impossible. And because at the end it's so awesome, but the journey there is, is kind of harsh. Right. So one thing I'm curious I, was, though, uh, actually, sorry, Ken, I'll let oh. you go first. I've been asking the question. No, I, I was, <laughs> was going to ask, like, was this right after uh, high school? Like you applied to art center after no, high school? No, no. Um, I, well, I went to Saturday high. So the reason why I knew I was, I had a good enough something was there was a Saturday high program and only very talented, like high school students would get in and, and they would allow you to go in and, and, and take that. But it was just like, seriously, it's like minors, minor classes and, and just basic foundational skills and, and all that stuff. And so I, I, w I started going there and, and that's how I kind of got started. And then after that, my portfolio started getting more developed, good enough to where I, right after high school, I got, I got in, like they accepted me, but I, I, I couldn't afford it. So, um, I had to find a way, <laughs> you know? Mm. Right. <clears throat> okay. What I actually uh, wanted to ask sorry. you really quickly yeah. before we move on to the next point. Uh, oh yeah. What I'll try to keep them to short, by the way, is that Oh, don't worry about it. Like I've even this <laughs> initial uh, introduction or like your origin story, you could say that you're sharing with us to me, I already find it really inspirational because uh, even sh briefly uh, before the podcast actually started, we were talking about the whole concept of grit yeah. and you certainly mm -hmm. seem to possess that in the bucketfuls. Yeah. And I'm, curious to know where you actually got that attitude from is it something that was passed down to you by your parents perhaps Absolutely. or did you have a different role model when it came to this no 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 my, my parents um if, if you go through their life it was way harder than anything i went through and so 
just mm-hmm. seeing them overcome those things like real life stuff not not yeah. art stuff um like real harsh mm-hmm. um things that 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 <laughs> they mm-hmm. overcame and they built a future for all of us like that was easy like oh shit that's hard my thing right now is way easier so it makes it helps you move forward yeah and so i want to and i'm always looking for things that are way too big you know just to just to actually keep up with my mm-hmm. parents and you know because they did something that was impossible <laughs> to most people and you know and and their journey was was if 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 you look at their journey from the beginning you'd say well, don't do it it's you'll it'll never happen you'll never do it um and then they did it so that makes me move forward you know hmm. mm-hmm. Were, you, were your parents always this supportive of you of going into art and pursuing no. yeah. illustrations? No, 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 no. <laughs> so they wanted the best no. for me. And they said, if you are an artist, you're going to starve and you're going to, you know, and he, my dad's exact <laughs> words is like, don't be an artist. They barely make any money. Be a mechanic. They make more money, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know? And so that, that was um that's when i knew that i loved it more than i thought i was going to be a poor artist but i'm like but i love it so much i'm okay with that uh, yeah it's quite similar to us even uh, back in indonesia or uh, where uh, perhaps added onto that there's a cultural uh, misunderstanding of what artists actually or do. stigma <laughs> yeah or stigma i think that would be the best word to use but if you are an artist then it would be associated to not having a job and you know that whole stereotype of an asian parent forcing their children to become doctors yeah. or lawyers and things like mm. that oh, so yeah. i think that's definitely a big obstacle for um a lot of people living in Asian countries. So it's quite interesting to hear that even uh, from your family as well, there was a similar pushback. Yes. Um, and I think I had a, I think my, my, my spirit was really, um, it, you, you, you couldn't destroy my spirit and it was really strong and my parents saw that so they just kind of backed off like there's no way they were ever going to convince me outside of that um they didn't support me they're like their kind of thing is we work our butts off so that you can be an artist uh, so they were they were upset but <laughs> they didn't get in my way either yeah hmm that's so in india it all kind of works out then they yeah it, they, it, I, i'm glad they they got to see a little bit of the, you know, like what I turned that into. And, and, you know, eventually my father said, I'm so glad you didn't become a mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> I think that could be like the best words you could hear. Oh from yeah. Me. Yeah. Like, like it, 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 and, and they really mean a lot because it proved that if you love something, you'll money will follow as long as you just stay true to it. Um, mm. And then, and, and, you know, as I as I kind of continued down my list of where I've been and how I got there, um, maybe some of that stuff will show in terms of how I valued a creativity over over financials. Um, and then usually it just worked mm. out. The rest of it just kind of became what it is. Um, so like, yeah. So mm. so I said it was that was the short story, and it ended up being the long story uh, or the long version. <laughs> um, uh. <laughs> No well, problem. I, I man. thoroughly enjoyed it. So <laughs> good. Good. Yeah. Um, you know, cool. Yeah. Then after well. like art center, um, I went. Uh, I didn't. I didn't really do a senior show at art center. You get this senior show, and you just kind of put all your art in the wall, and all these art directors and from many studios come all over the place, and they look at your stuff, and um, and pretty much just kind of hire you sometimes directly off your wall or, or they remember you, they take your cards and then they kind of match it to the projects that they're going. But I didn't want to put my stuff up there mainly because most of my stuff wasn't designed for visuals. It was, I've always kind of focused on, you know, just, and maybe it's an excuse, maybe my art sucked and I didn't want to show anybody, but I thought my imagination <laughs> was stronger. Um, so I just thought I had a good creative mind and I had good ideas and I just, I was going to have to figure out a way how to sell that and describe that to other companies so that they could come hire me or, or give me a job. 
Um, and so what happened is I skipped it. And then one of the counselors ended up talking to some of the studios, I guess, during the show. And they're like, okay, you don't have your, your show. Bring, bring your portfolio with you and I'll introduce you to some people. And, and then they, I, oh, I talked fantastic. to, I talked to several studios cause she believed in me and she said, um, there's stuff in there that people need to see. Um, and one of them was mm -hmm. Sony. Um, and so I'm gonna try it. This is the short version. Cause it's, there's another deep story behind that. But like, um, I pretty much had a conversation <laughs> so with them, many layers. showed them what I liked uh, or showed them my portfolio. They're like, I like this. I like that. And then they went away like everybody else. And it was just pretty much cool. And then I remember he said something like, okay, cool. This is perfect. Um, I think, I think we hmm. can, we can definitely use that. And then. As we walked away, mm. he did say something and I, it never clicked until afterwards, but it like, he said, he says, welcome aboard. Right. But I, I'm like, what the, f what does that mean? Oh, wow. What? So I, I don't know what that meant. So <laughs> I, this is like two months later, he calls me and it's like, Hey, why don't you come down to Sony, um, San Diego to a studio and, um, you know, cause we want to, we want to, we want to talk to you about some stuff um that we have planned mm -hmm. um and so just come on down mm -hmm. and uh hopefully it'll all work out and so like i'm like okay whatever um <laughs> i went down there my sisters all kind of made me get into a suit and the suit was twice as big as me so they <laughs> rolled it up and i looked like a big <laughs> geek in an adult suit and i'm like shrinking inside of it and so you know game industry who yeah. shows up with a suit like that's how <laughs> exactly <laughs> my thoughts it's so wrong it's so wrong and so i show up i get in line and then at the time the game industry was like there wasn't a lot of jobs so having a job at that point where you're you're amazing um so like uh, there's no mm. not exaggerating it's about 200 people with their portfolios outside of sony studios in san diego and they were all looking for a job uh, there was two openings and they were all trying to get that so 200 people showed up to that studio and they're lined up for this job. I'm there in line and they're like, oh, what are you here for? Oh, they called me too. They said that I can come in for the for the interview, I guess. And I'm sitting there and then I finally get uh, a call on my newly new flip phone back then. And then he's like, uh, <laughs> where are you? And I'm like, I'm here, I'm here. And it's like, oh, okay, well, I don't see you. And I'm like, no, no I'm in the line outside. And they're like, no, you're hired. You got hired on day one, like get in here. <laughs> so that's how I found out that they hired me. Just, that's amazing. just like that. And of course I walk in, uh, the art director, uh, Ron Padua shows up in a wetsuit cause he just came back from the beach. So he's like, <laughs> puts his surfboard to the side in his office, walks out and starts talking to us and says, we got Neopets, we got, uh, SOCOM. Um, and I think there was this other one that was pretty cool. I forgot exactly what that was. Um, but there was like three projects that we can, that they were going to have us assign. And so, you know, everybody's with their flip flops and their game shirts and everybody looks cool except me. Cause I'm in a suit. And so, you know, er, like, <laughs> like, so by the way, at that time I was like number one in SOCOM in the world playing SOCOM. So that would have been like my, my oh, ultimate game to is, work on. That's impressive. right. So this was for yeah. SOCOM too. And I would have killed for to be on that team. So he looks at me and then he looks at the other artists and they're like, you're on SOCOM, you're on this other project, SOCOM, SOCOM. So, and he looks at me in the suit and he goes, oh yeah, you're on Neopets for sure. And he puts me on Neopets. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no, inside. Because of the suit. Because of the suit. And I know that, uh, I know that. I actually never asked him, but I know that he put me on Neopets because of the suit. But I gave them the best Neopets ever. <laughs> Um, and it, it took, it took about a month or two to kind of switch over to SOCOM. Uh, so they're like, oh yeah, you, 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 this is pretty cool stuff. So they threw me onto SOCOM right after that. But I'm like, I was actually liking a lot of the Neopet stuff too. So, um, so that's that, that's Sony. And, <laughs> and it worked out really great. I, I, I ended up, uh, doing a lot of, it was through the cinematics department. We started kind of building up and, um, you know, they threw me in kind of like a little tiny room and started working on, uh, some sketches. I was like through Sony San Diego, uh, Sony Santa Monica, they were working and they were like, 
sharing resources and they, they just had me do a whole bunch of little sketches for this game called Dark Odyssey. Uh, and that's what was uh, God of War called before it became uh, God of War. Um, and so I was just kind of doing these, mm. uh, you know, Cyclops characters and these skeleton armies and all this stuff. And, um, you know, like Kratos actually looked like a Greek uh, dude with even the leaves around, like he looked like a dork. Um, and so uh. he, he wasn't bald <laughs> and cool. Like I was doing the literally like Greek mythology characters. He almost looked like, um, you know, like David uh, from the statue of David. Um, uh, right. like it, it was kind of like, that's the kind of, uh, you know, cradles I was creating. And so I'm like hitting some things I hid and some things I didn't, but overall I have no idea why they didn't fire me on day one. Um, cause my, my stuff was horrible, but my ideas I think were strong. Um, and so I did Sony for, for about mm. four years doing a lot of like their early IP stuff. They always threw the early stuff at me. Um, and then the, I, I think that's why they did that. My ideas were stronger than my skills um and mm. uh and then i was doing also films at that time i was i was working with like jerry brokheimer um i was working with you know like just any kind of like even low budget films that i learned a lot from um to like some really good like i, I think at the time i was even doing some uh early development on um like uh, Avatar the movie, like super early of uh, development stuff. Oh, really? Um, and and so like I was mm. doing films and games with Sony. So I I started my own company right after that, and that's um, that's when I start uh, out of my garage. There were several artists working, and some of them were working remotely. So I was kind of like the first one to ever like ha have a team that was working remotely, um, and we were just kind of like whatever Sony and these films were doing, we were just having them kind of do the work um and and eventually that that was going really well i was probably at the time i was i was actually making a ton of money um but it was i, I stopped being a, mm -hmm. an artist i was more of a manager a business owner i started going down the list of everything else that i didn't want to be um and so i started backing off from that um and then after that, I kind of went. So that's why you made your own studio then i made my own studio because i couldn't i didn't i didn't learn to say no and I didn't, I like, I, I think Sony and other film studios thought I was like the most amazing negotiator in the world, but, um, I just had so many people calling to, um, to, for work. Right. And so I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And then I, I have like five things at the same time, which is really dumb, but I'm, my brain was saying, what if you don't have anything next month? Right. Um, and so I was, I took on so much work that. I had to hire people to kind of do it. Um, and so that that's what kind of got me in right. trouble. And and eventually I started learning how to manage and, and do all that stuff. And, and you know, hmm. kind of, right. I, I, I kind of want to uh, take us to the point where you talked about having the idea and not the skill. And I think that's also what got you hired by yeah. Sony in the first place, right? Because you you don't really have this beautiful illustrations because I'm sure at that point there was not even a job called no. concept artist or whatever, right? And if I looked at your history, you were studying illustration yeah. in art college, uh, art center, right? And so I want to bring us to the topic of this, this idea versus, maybe not versus no. idea and skill, I guess, and what what made you got hired in the first place? You know? Yeah, no, and, and, and I think like, so I, I'll try and speed up because I think it kind of makes a little bit sense of how I kind of evolved. Um, Sony, Sony was more mm -hmm. of like idea. Um, and then once I started, I moved to Vancouver for a small studio that made multiplayer games. Um, they taught me how to do game development and it was like boot camp for game development. Um, and so that was, that's where I learned how to make games. Sony is really how to like develop IPs. And that's, that's a huge difference. So production versus development. Um, and then, you know, then Sony ended up calling me back to be more of a production with development skills. Um, and I started kind of doing some, some work for them. And right when I was going to get hired, this small stu studio, 
hired me for my development skills, which was like I was making tiny little characters at night um, that were that were like six hours long, right? Um, and they were more of like so creative, like just throw anything. Just here, we want a pirate, and then I'm like drawing these characters, and 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 then by the time I give it to them, they're shipping them, and they're already in the game, and 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 I'm seeing them play in the game, and I'm like, what? How's this happening? It's only been two weeks, and this character already came out. Um, and that was Riot Games. I, I I was only doing that for the love oh. of my craft, um, and they were giving me zero, you know, uh, like it was all just based off of my imagination and and creativity. They just gave me a few lines, and they just kind of said, throw it over the fence and say, get us these characters, and we like it. We'll use them. We don't. We don't. Um, and and that's kind of I was I was going to be an art director at Sony, uh, San, uh, at Sony Santa Monica. Um, um, on uh, Battle Royale, I forgot what the name was because it was called something else um, when I was in development. But that was going to get me into a more productive men mentality, but I wanted to be more creative. So like mm. Ri Riot mm. was an unknown. They said I had to be a concept artist. They were going to pay me a lot less. Um, and it was a way more risk. And then I don't know, they, they were a startup. So I don't even know if they were going to be, they were going to be around in a year, right? Um, so I went from Sony to Riot only mm -hmm. because I was like, I was I was given the ability to be more creative um, versus more production, ment uh, more more of a production mentality and 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 task driven, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of situation. Um, and so like your back to your question is, um, like the difference between you know production and creativity is all based off of what you want. One's not better than the other. It's just that you want to kind of start thinking about what the difference was. And and from very, from the very beginning, I started as a very creative person, but I also knew that I needed to also build up my production skills. Um, and so that took me a long time. So I, I, mm. I think it's just knowing that there's the two uh, tracks and knowing that you need to either pick one or the other and understand the difference. And then and then if you need both of them, you need to start developing them and, and you, knowledge, it, knowing that you need to start developing one over the other um, is important to start thinking about that so that you can kind of have a plan for that um, and be more more well-rounded. Um, does that make sense? I know I kind of ranted for that yeah. for a little bit. Yeah. I think even now though, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. still that uh, lack of distinction or lack of awareness that there is these two different fields in a way because I think a lot of people actually get into art because they tend to draw like fan art of their favorite characters yeah. so a lot of people follow the illustrative route I suppose or the pr production side of things rather than the creative side yep. so I'm just wondering like how did you actually find yourself falling more into the creative side and when did you realize that there was this distinction um well there was um well i just always kind of gravitated to story-based games um action adventures versus just kind of like you know just like button mashing and something that didn't make sense so like my preference was those type of things and a film like a, a a movie like Star Wars is way more interesting than something that was just shallow. And like even some some things that were funny, mm -hmm. like you enjoyed them, but you're like didn't satisfy me, like something with a deep story or something with a unique story. Um, so I would just always gravitate to that. But I I started realizing that I needed other skills when, um, in you know I was doing Sony work, but I was developing the game, right? Um, but they were like, oh no, we're the game developers. You're you're just kind of like. You know, you're you're doing the narrative side of the art, and and they would they really separated me away from game development. And I'm like, well, I want to I want to be in the trenches. I want to I want to be part of making a game. How do you how do you do that? Yeah. Um. And so knowing mm -hmm. that I don't have any of those skills, and I had to develop them quickly, um, is what made me realize that there are two two tracks, and that you do have to know what you what what where you, where you're at, and if you want to go somewhere else. If you want to go somewhere else and, and develop other skills, you need to be aware of it first. So um, that's kind of how it happened. It's just more of like I wanted to get closer and closer to the game development process and they wouldn't allow me because I didn't realize that I was lacking those skills, um, but I was. Mm. Hmm. 
Hmm. Interesting. So, how did they? How how did that? I guess um, that that idea skill get put to use in Riot games because because um, the designs in Riot games in League of Legends and stuff is really unique, right? Like, and mm-hmm. how did you get yeah. started on that? You well, know? technically, every 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 part of my life is a is kind of like the same story of what happened at at riot and on league of legends um league of legends was Mm -hmm. it was a game like it started out make a chomp champion concept and you got to do it within six to 12 hours um and then you throw it over the fence and Mm -hmm. hopefully we'll have an amazing champion at, at the end of it um but it was really more function the function was we need a champion every two weeks and we got to get and spit out mm. the quickest read possible. And 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 there's no room for creativity. There's no room for like, how does this work in this universe? Because there was none. It was just like anything goes. Just make a really cool character. Um, oh. And if you and if you if you okay. put any time of any time to the creative sector, um, if you spent any time kind of like second guessing a champion, then you lose. You, you 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 lose the deadlines like you you will not meet the deadlines and wow not delivering to our players uh, every two weeks was probably the worst thing you could ever think of doing at at riot at the time so it's like just get there on time make it good enough hmm. make them love it and keep going and just do one after the other so there was no room for anything is does this does this fit with the other champions? Is this functional against uh, gameplay? Um, is this the coolest thing ever? Is this unique? Like none of that stuff. Just go and make it. Um, and then over time, it started shifting. It started saying, well, we need to start being more strategic as to how these champions are released. Sometimes we release too many assassins. Sometimes we have tanks. And then based off of that, we started categorizing them. And then we started being, we started thinking about function. And then really honing in the the, mm. the the visuals around, you know, game design. Can we communicate their source of power? Can we communicate their abilities and their strong, like like their their, their strengths and weaknesses, through the visuals? And and so then we slow down just for game design, and people were like, okay, cool. Um, now we have more people. We still deliver every two weeks, but now we have more people on the side to kind of think about just game design. But they would never ever look at. Uh, not that they wouldn't, nobody ever said, let's not look at any narrative or creative side of things. He said that there was no time. Um, but at least we had, we started building out time for function and game design and strengthening the fun. And I think that was the right call. Um, and then we we built uh, out of function, we started creating more of a backlog and we started creating something where we, we started having and hiring the right people that would start to develop earlier on um, these these champions but even if we started thinking about the theme it was more of like hey this is going to be a ninja but not shen and um but it but it but it but it's going to have these abilities and then we started thinking about who these characters are um not not against the world not against this ip just against who he is and maybe things that kind of affected him and made him the way he is so we started doing many stories that kind of gravitated about around that um that champion and that was good enough and that was some creativity but again when you do one character and then the other character right next to it, um, we're having their own little ecosystem, having their own little story, and then you put them together and they don't mesh. And then like all forty characters after that, none of them were con- none of them were creating a bigger picture, right? None of, them, <laughs> none of them were echoing this universe. None of them were echoing like a real world. And so that's mm-hmm. where we started. Or, or, or I started looking at a little bit of it, and a few of us started looking at it and say, we don't have a, an IP, we don't have a universe, we don't have a world that we can build, tell stories out of, and we can build characters that come out of that ecosystem with a bunch of constraints that are all attached to like the the world and 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 its behaviors and its its um, like when when you when you build a world, you're building a ton of constraints like. If you build the world of you know Earth, and and our world, our world is built with, you can't jump a hundred you know feet in the air. There's gravity, and so like now you could only kind of deal with gravity and how mm-hmm. things look and all that stuff. So all of a sudden you can't create any character. You have to kind of 
create earthlings and humans and and what yes. they do so like you you limit it and you have to be creative in that world but you are creating a cohesive world we we then started thinking about mm. that and that was the fun part but as soon as we started talking about that there was this huge backlash and i understand why they were fearful that our players might reject that kind of direction and also most of the game developers that were like on like most of riot were looking at that and saying no we have an ip it's called league of legends and the ip is defined as anything goes because our players love it and, you know like love it so we were already kind of putting ourselves in this kind of like little box and we weren't we were afraid mm -hmm. to come out of it because literally every and they were right it was it's successful we could do anything we want and by the way all these constraints slow us down and it costs money and and there were so many reasons why they were so right um but i think we had to start thinking about how do we make everybody right and i think one of the one of the, one of the good ideas and how and what gave us like the courage to move forward is we started saying the game is the game the game will never change the ip is no longer the ip of league of legends we're the room terra is the world so we're going to develop this world called mm -hmm. room terra and you guys can keep doing your what you're doing and if this doesn't work when you'll never you'll never need to use it so we separate ourselves away from the game development which is something that i didn't like that much um but we had to isolate ourselves and not uh hold any of the team back because they needed to deliver you know champions and skins and and they were doing amazing things mm. and so we started kind of going into this little R&D world where we have to kind of like mm. now make rule sets that everybody's going to hate if we do it wrong but we have to make we have to make them so awesome that they were going to love them and um and so like that's kind of how it started it, it, it the, the idea was um if you make a true IP you will make multiple games and multiple tv series and multiple films and multiple like everything <laughs> you know and marketing different uh, aspects of it right. and, and i know that's a kind of like reflecting a little bit of what's happening but at the time they were only thinking of one game and one mentality is like league of legends is already super popular we don't need to if it ain't broke why fix it kind of thing and we were on our end thinking mm -hmm. And it was very insulting to a lot of people. We got a lot of backlash and they were saying, we don't think that League of Legends is going to be the only IP. And we think that the IP is going to be bigger than League of Legends. And we do believe, and, and I don't know if we were right or wrong, but like League of Legends is going to inspire and and carry the the uh, the universe and the IP together. So they, they, they will be one to one and they're both going to be just as strong, but eventually more and more products become uh, become way more interesting. It's kind of like Mickey Mouse and Disney, right? This Mickey Mouse is no longer the IP. Disney is its own IP now. Disney right. has its own kind of like ecosystem and it become way bigger than Mickey Mouse itself. Um, and I think Disney can't live without Mickey Mouse, but it's not how we see Disney anymore. Um, League of Legends is always going to be a part of this IP called, you know, Runeterra, but I think eventually if i'm right and a lot of us are right um rune terra is going to be the bigger one in the in the long run and now and that was really hard for people to swallow so that mentality from going to from production to creativity and what and how you do things um led to me realizing that holy crap if i have to kind of go and find artists that are thinking uniquely thinking outside the box i can't use a lot of production artists um, I have to start looking for development artists. Um, I have to visual development artists that that think outside the box, that create new ideas, that um, that are going to invent uh, a situation versus regurgitate a lot of what's out there. And, and and early on, if you notice, a lot of like the League of Legends champions were uh, tropes, things that people instantly read. And I think that was super strategic and amazing that they did that because it worked. But when you're building a whole new world, you have mm. to start thinking from scratch and thinking, let's differentiate ourselves from the industry and, and games, films, and everything. Like we're, we're building an IP that is multiple industries probably. Uh, you know, it, it should reach beyond that. And we ended up doing a little bit of that, right? 
Sorry if I I rant a lot, so you guys have to stop me. No, I, it's been super yeah, interesting. The funny <laughs> thing is, when you're ra- quiet. even when you're <laughs> ranting, you're it. It feels like you're reading my mind on like the full follow up questions that I'd have. So it's not like you're ranting and you're going <laughs> off track. You're kind of just like going on the rails that we would have wanted it to go, anyways. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. That's that's really awesome. Yeah. But one. So I I guess we can. Sorry, sorry. You no, go no, ahead. you go ahead. I was go just ahead. gonna ask. <laughs> is that I want to take a little bit of a step back because we've been talking about this whole uh, concept of ideas yeah. and visual development. One thing I'm curious is that what do you consider to be the, I guess, mm, the requirements for what makes a good idea or what makes an artist very capable of handling that task of visual development? Mm. I guess uh, to add to that, like what separates an artist that does um, yeah. creative, does the creative side, the visual development side, versus the one that does more of the production <sighs> side. What mm. makes them different? I guess it's more of like. Well, first, let me do the caveat. One is not more important than the other. Sometimes you need one over the other, and and there is no order. Um, so if you are a someone that is like an illustrator and renders the heck out of something, um, it's okay. And if you're a creative that isn't strong at finishing work, but is strong at ideation, um, that's okay too. And and they're both equally as important. Um, I always see it as skills versus creativity. I know that some people think that what they're working on is always creative and, and, and you could always I don't think you can't argue that there is a level of creativity in everything that we do in art, but I'm talking about creative that is Mm. focused with goals and, um, and, and, and they lead to a very specific, um, set of, of criteria. Um, and that's the difference. It's more of like, how do you, how are you creative to solve this problem? And, and, and so that's, you know, skill is like, I'm trying to make this as beautiful as possible, as clean as possible, as as polished as possible, so that uh, you know it it just it just looks beautiful. Uh, creative is like, can I make more sense out of it? Can I add function to it? Um, you know, if I was to break it down in key words, um, design uh, versus rendering or refinements. Um, design, like, let's say, illustrators are make things beautiful they Mm -hmm. focus on things that are popular trendy um they focus on things that are like fan art and then you kind of do versions of that um and and i think people that are more design um side they're on the design side they 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 create unique um unique situations unique characters they always try to think outside the box and try to create something that is hasn't been seen before and that's really difficult by the way i don't know if people achieve it as much because every everybody's been is doing everything right um visual like a visual cog in a story like you're 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 creating artwork that has a purpose and that belongs in and is part of a story that's one of the bigger ones is is can you can you create can you be super creative and unique with a story const- like a story constraining your uh, your your design that's that's hard and then also function like mm. you're you're uh someone that is a designer is also thinking okay nobody's ever seen this it's part of the story and it has a function um you know like a gun that is in you know uh let's say let's say you know in a very like sci-fi steampunk world so like it has to look steampunk it has to kind of have this function and it has to have some level of uh, of sci-fi and that combination that it has to look like it's functional in that story in that world um and then of course you might google steampunk gun sci-fi steampunk gun and you might get a thousand of them then you have to be in a place where it's completely unique so you're like i want my gun to not so you you go research steampunk you know sci-fi gun and then you see all of these and your goal is to make sure it doesn't look like any of those and still feel steampunk (laughs) and and that's that's a really different way of thinking instead of like i think more people that are like concept 
artists instead of concept designers, um, they were going to look at a uh, and reference a whole bunch of steampunk guns uh, slash sci-fi, and they're going to look at it and they're going to put all those things together and try to like make their version of that. Um, that's very different mm -hmm. mentality. I want to make sure that it doesn't even look like any of, any of these versus I'm going to grab all these things together, put it and make sure that it like it, it borrows from a lot of things so that it, mm -hmm. you can get maximize steampunk and maximize sci-fi. And then once you do that, you, since you borrow from a lot of what everybody else is doing, it ends up getting, it ends up being part of that, you know, like that Google search, you, you, you look just like the rest, but you solved it perfectly. And it does, and it's your interpretation of that. So that's where like people get confused. That's like, that's the unique aspect is mine's is different than theirs. But, but if you look at them as a whole, somebody looks at it and it's like, they all kind of look the same. And that's the art, yeah. the art station yeah. mentality, right? Uh, when you look at art station as a whole, yeah. you're like, this is gorgeous work. And then you look at one character and you're like, oh my God, this, this samurai is amazing. And then you click on samurai and then, mm. then there's kind of like a whole bunch of that version of that. And, and, uh, and it's not our art, art station's fault. It's been happening before art hub before yeah. that, um, you know, like then, then you had, um, all sorts of forums where people were just kind of looking at each other's work, getting influenced, whether it's purpose, purposely or not, you end up kind of borrowing from things and then you become a concept artist. Um, and then I think, mm. I think I'd rather be a concept designer uh, and sacrifice a little yes. bit of like fidelity and, you know, refinement. Mm. Does that kind yeah. of, so how does one do that then? How does one yeah. avoid this whole imitation mentality and actually come up mm. with original ideas? Yeah. Um, I, I think right after I, I, I... Yeah, but we... I, oh. I can't see my you webcam. Guys. You guys are... Oh, we're back on. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Okay. Yeah, we're back. Okay, yeah. okay. All right. I'll, I'll try to... Oh, so, you know, we were, we were pretty much talking about, um, you know, how, how to kind of get to that, how to figure out how to get people to be more creative and be more um, mm -hmm. world builders and, and yes. stuff like that. And, um, the juicy stuff pretty yeah. much. Uh, and, and I think like I went through, <laughs> I went through like world building boot camp at Riot Games when I, when I was part of like creating the world building team and then putting that effort and building the, building the team and hiring people that ended up being my bosses in many ways. And, and, and they were way better at their part. But like putting this whole thing together really was a learning uh, experience. And I, whatever I thought was creative uh, problem solving in, in, the, in the visual side of things and the narrative side of things was, uh, was, it turned out to be way beyond what I thought it was going to be. And I learned so much. And so right after I left Riot, um, I had that in mind and I, and I, and I just couldn't, I, I, there was just, it was a time to pause and I saw a lot of individuals that were, um, were, were lacking those creative skills, but you know, like, how do I, how do I help? How do I build into that? But it almost mm -hmm. happened naturally where studios started calling me and saying, Hey, can you do some consulting for, for us? Um, mo our teams, we have like, you know, uh, a portfolio of games and we have a certain look and it's kind of consistent. And it, the problem is, is that our, our artists or every time we create a new IP, they kind of do the same thing over and over again. And, you know, mm -hmm. is it, is it, you know, some of the, some of the conversations is do we, do we kind of like let go of everybody and go find a new team or what, how do we solve this mm -hmm. problem? And, mm -hmm. and then, you know, like yeah. it, it's, it's, it's kind of a real problem that people have. Like some, some studios have that same look over and over again. And sometimes they, they embrace it. This studio, wanted to do something, mm. wanted to do true game development and, and, and do a different game every time they turned around. And I, I, I remember having a conversation with one studio and, and these, and I, and I don't want to say which studio and, and give them out names because I want to respect um, the effort that people did in these exercises and that, you know, right. that it could be very complex and, and, and humbling to people that are even veterans in the industry and realizing that they, they haven't been practicing um, creativity or, 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 or storytelling in the arts as much as they should have. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would do kind of like these, these workshops where we would, and, and, and they, they pretty much vary. Um, one, one workshop is more of like, Hey, grab this, you know, 
grab this game, right? And turn it into this other game and just turn the visuals. But, um, and, and I would do all sorts of anything and everything to kind of get them to build a scenario. Like, see this game, this game doesn't have a narrative and doesn't have a world and doesn't have like any rule sets and like, let's build one and then figure out what that might look like, how that might, that game might change. But um, I also learned that they were all being influenced by media, by um, art station or, or just Googling things. And so one of the one of the more successful kind of like things that they did was um, I had them completely shut down the the internet, Wi-Fi, um, you know, phones. They had no they had no contact outside of this room for hours. Um, and 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 now we gave them like a set of like five criteria, like you know something like you know uh, like and I'll, and these are all just examples that are going to pop into my head, but like space cowboy ninja uh, or or something like that and it's like whatever that is those were all the catalyst to what you're going to build and um but at, but at the same time it has to be something completely out of your out of your mind that's just you think it doesn't exist and uh, and be super creative and forget about your skills forget about making it look pretty don't spend any time and the and i and i emphasize that your work will suffer the look your, your art is going to look like shit and it should because now you're in a place where you haven't been doing a lot of that. Um, and and they found themselves struggling. They found themselves in a new world and they found themselves like thinking, uh, like, I am i can't believe that I can't come up with this. Like these are, some of these guys were veteran artists and I'm, I'm, I was surprised because I respect their art. And I mean, I've seen their art and they're like, that's pretty awesome. And all of a sudden they just struggled all the way through. and. And that was beautiful. <laughs> that was beautiful that they um, that, that they they started just purely only thinking about what they could think about based on their their creative limitations. Um, and then and that's a scary thought. Like mm -hmm. we got free reign at Riot, and the only limitations we mm. and we were spoiled, right? It was a perfect situation. Like we got unlimited funding, unlimited time. Um, we 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 didn't really have a lot of uh, constraints in terms of a, you know we can hire people like we can hire the right people, and so the funny thing is is that the only thing in our way was our own creativity, and that mm. is scary as hell. You realize that am I really creative? And these guys in this room had to yeah. face that for the first time. It's like how creative am I? Because I keep <laughs> drawing something yeah. that you know, and then then. Then throughout the day, we started saying, okay, we got to make sure that we challenge each other and push each other to a very unique space. And then at the end of the day, we also got to challenge each other to make sure that we aren't regurgitating things that we have experienced through media, through films, through games that we played, because half the day was more spent of, oh, well, that looks like this game, or that looks like this film, or that looks like this character. And so mm -hmm. like they find themselves like, oh, I finally got something. And everybody's like, no, that looks like this. And then finding a space where it's kind of unique and different and new, um, all of a sudden they're realizing that I haven't been doing this enough. And so I think just admitting to yourself, understanding, turn everything off, create a, 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 a space where you kind of start doing sketches and think of something that is completely new. And then, you know what I would do as well? I would... And this is what I do myself. Like mm. whenever I think I got a character that is super unique, what I do is I reverse Google's image search and see if through that character sketch, another version comes up that looks like mm. it. Um, and so interesting. That, that's really interesting. Exercise. <laughs> that's what I would do as well. And I think, um, you know, they didn't do that, but I know that I do that to myself. So like, if you want to start being and, and, and exercising the creative aspects of it, like create a mini story, mm -hmm. which you are creating, you know, um, constraints and you're creating a narrative motivation. And then all of these things will, will keep mm -hmm. you from exploring anything that you want. But now you have the ability to say um, in this world, there's gravity, but they also have magic, but, they uh, they never travel. They don't have vehicles. They don't have machines. And so, like within all those things, you have to create something unique, and you have to now create something that doesn't exist. And then, as you create it, keep checking it. Do those reverse Google searches. Ask people, what does this look like? Mm. Um, and then, 
and then just have a, a, a portfolio of crappy art that you would never show to anybody, but you'll start to realize that as you keep doing that, your creative abilities start to come and flow much faster. Mm. And when somebody then hires you, they're not going to hire you because you know how to render the heck out of a stone. They don't, they're, you're not going to render the heck out of a house that, or things that already exist. And there's nothing wrong when you do that, something like that. But if somebody says, Hey, we have this game, it's based in this world. And these are the, these are the major constraints and we need to like, Add, have you add a town in this world you're like holy crap how do i do that and you find yourself kind of like um and you or you find yourself out of a job like i i know that i do that i'm like oh you kind of missed it. this is a beautiful artwork and actually it's one of the most beautiful pieces that i've gotten back but it completely missed in terms of the assignment this isn't the world that we were we we're dealing with and that's when you start finding yourself in a space where i can build into a world i can build a world i can create a story and build out of that and then you start becoming a story uh, artist like an illustrator like writing you can write your own books and you can start developing illustrations based off of that and 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 all the illustrations are really mimicking and enhancing and supporting the story versus mm -hmm. you know just beautiful art mm -hmm. you know um cover art or something like that you know i see so can how, you actually how, uh, Go on, Ken. Sorry, Sorry. one question. Um, this, you mentioned about uh, doing this really crappy sketches, but just full of ideas yeah. and stuff, right? But how do you, how do you put that out in your portfolio? Because it seems like a lot of um, studios nowadays they mm -hmm. look for both the finished quality and also the yeah. design part of it. That's a great. But question. if you just put out like crappy sketches, then it might not look as interesting yeah. and people might skip it I, I don't know like how how do you deal with that like what's your take um on all my really so I don't know how cool they are to be honest with you but like what I feel are my most unique and coolest ideas I'm never going to show those they're it's it's ugly thoughts it's kind of like like thinking out loud and you just write it down before you forget it and you never want to show that to mm. anybody because who wants to buy a book full of like random crap that just doesn't make any sense but you eventually want to take those ideas <laughs> and make sense out of them put them in 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 a way where they're all kind of like it's so well developed and so thought out and that you can have a series now built out for that some of those ideas um and organize them in a way where like somebody is looking at beautiful art but the right person is going to look at it and say wow, I love the story that you're telling. So when I switched, when I started doing that, I stopped getting people looking at my portfolio and saying, oh, I freaking love this character. It's so cool. Oh, I love this. I love how this, like, the look at the look at the shirt. Like, it looks so realistic. Like, what kind of material is that? What kind of, uh, what, what kind of, like, um, what kind of, oh, what kind of brushes did you use? If you're being asked what kind of brushes did you use, um, you might, you might, it might be a hint that you might need to do a little bit more creative storytelling. Um, the reason why is I get a lot of this stuff now. I get, wow, look at that character. I can feel its anger. Or how, how in the world, like that, that, like I can see the energy. I can see the power. Um, like it, that is that a king or a leader like very specific things like now my characters yeah. if i'm if i'm creating an emperor people are like oh my god who is this an emperor what emperor did you build the did you build a world that is there a backstory to this tell me more about this this character instead of like yeah. this character's cool i can't believe it. like look at the gun it's like really badass um and i i don't think there's wrong yeah. or right answers but i love the fact that people are looking at my characters as potential real characters in a potential film and movie mm -hmm. and game um they i try to bring them to life mm -hmm. and and most of those characters are come from hundreds and hundreds of tiny little mistakes in creative sketching that i'm nobody's ever going to see but if somebody ever says hey i want you to create this character i've i've been developing the ability to do that at at at, at will and so now when somebody says that, I'm like, oh shit, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it as fast. Sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's slow, but 
I haven't let anybody down in terms of developing a character that hits that mark. And now, now you got people that are way more skilled and they're like, oh, that's a really cool character. They pat me in the back. Now let me make it pretty because it's you're not that great at, 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 at rendering the heck out of something. <laughs> and and so now you got amazing artists that are great renders grabbing some of my ideas and taking them to that next step and they look beautiful um and so like i decide not to focus on rendering and and they decide not to focus on story and and then that's why there's a separation of two and that's why one is not um more yeah. important than the other the uh the one thing the caveat behind that and i'll and and and, and i don't know how true that is because there are some people that are making a ton of money doing just a bunch of rendering stuff right but in general i know oh, that yeah. there's a lot of people <laughs> out there that can render and that most people are focused on learning and building up their skill sets um and that's okay but it's just the competition is so high that it's just not going to ever be a place where you're going to advance and and grow from financially and so like if you're creative i try looking for creative concept like concept designers versus concept artist, um, if I find a concept designer, I'm going after them and, I'm like, and, and this is the way the conversation goes. Hey, I'd love to work with you. No, I'm busy. Uh, how busy can I, can I, can we work in about a month or two? No, I'm booked all the way to like six months. All right, let's, let's do six months. Um, okay, cool. But uh, I can, I'll be available. But if I get something else, I get to pick, pick and choose. So you have to convince me whether your project is cool enough for me to do it because I'm going to have like other people and I'm like, cool. Um, and by the way, even if I like it, if these other people pay me more and it's just kind of like one level less cool than yours, like I'm like, okay, fine. We'll pay you a whole bunch more money and you get to pick which project you work. And so that's the big difference is if you're, if you, if you're the few, the, the individuals that are creative, that are thinking about design and that are thoughtful and things that just like take a little bit more energy, creative energy. Um, there's less of them, so they're all being sought after, and then you can pretty much negotiate um, your world, and you have more control over, like, I love this type of work. I get to pick and choose which work, and guess what? And you're going to get paid more than the average concept artist, and that is why I think one, for me, is better than the other because I get to be super creative. I get to try something new every every year or something like that, and um there's less competition so there's more there's there's more opportunities and and that's the only difference but in terms of like if if being a concept artist and you rendering illustrations and making them super polished based off of a character that like is already being created like a overwatch character now you have to do the illustration for it or like a character and you have to and, and on league of legends and you have to do a splash for it like absolutely some of those are gorgeous and you rock because i love looking at those um but it's just not for me and mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean that whatever i do is better yeah. than not and not um so I, I i don't ever want to diminish anybody else's passion and what they love it shouldn't be that way we all we all like what we do and if you love it stick to it but but we but in this world right now there's just in the in the art world that we have now it's just there's just not enough visual designers that that it's just yeah. hard to find and and it's an opportunity and also a call for us to kind of be a little bit more um responsible with with how we create yeah. art instead of just regurgitating a lot of the same stuff and most of it that uh, to me unfortunately yeah. is 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 mimicking other people's artwork and polishing it better than the other person yeah hmm. i think unfortunately is that just some people don't really know any better it's like i grew up just drawing fan art of a lot of my favorite characters from the shows <laughs> that i grew up watching because that's all that i knew existed it wasn't until much later that i re discovered that there was actually such a thing such as, as concept art and concept design yeah. and once i found out that something like that existed i knew that that was what i wanted to pursue over illustration so yeah yeah i think it's sometimes because of conversations like this that people actually realize that there is such an option of that's available to them and they'll actually begin going down that path 
as evidenced by some of the comments in the chat that we have actually. Mm-hmm. And there's a comment like by my cabbages saying that, well, time to become a concept designer. <laughs> and Taya also says, can't believe I had so little idea about this line of work. I thought there's only concept artists and splash artists. No, there's there's multiple versions of artists. Um, and you just got to do what you got to do what makes you happy. Um, but at the same time, you have to know that there's a difference. So whenever you get in a, you know, when, when you get a job from from a studio or a commission or something like that, and, and they ask you something that is more creative and, 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 and you fail, you have to think to yourself, how often do you practice being creative and coming up with new things? And, yeah. and not just unique, like you can't just do only unique. It has to be with a ton of constraints. You know, it, it, it gets really difficult. And some of the, some of the world building stuff, it was easy at first cause we can do anything. But then once we started tying everything up to each other and making a sense of it, um, and Runeterra and, you know, Runeterra magic and, um, source of power, all that stuff had rules now. And then like Demacian armor had a certain anti-magic and, and now you can't just create any Demacian character. They had to have all of these rules and constraints yeah. to them and you still have to make them cool and then you have to make them unique. So it got harder and harder and harder yeah. as we went and people got more and more frustrated, especially within the team. But at the end of the day, they're <laughs> going to all look back and everyone is going to look back and say, there was, there's a lot of unified themes and unified systems and organized systems in this universe and they're going to be able to draw so much out of it um in in the future and i and i guarantee you in about 10 years you're going to see yeah. so many things come out of that ip and league of legends every game has you know a cycle and and and, and a start and, and and a death to it right like maybe league of legends will forever kind mm-hmm. of play but it won't be as popular as it is now but i think the ip will take over and be its future mm-hmm. for sure and there's an interesting point that you mentioned about oh the the artists in the team they start to get frustrated because of the difficulties that of tying everything together then my, my question is like what was the first big moment of breakthrough for the project then like when everything just comes together and then everyone just feels like oh it finally clicked for them you know do you recall something like that i'm trying not to say the wrong thing but it's the only the only time (laughs) that i found out that every starting to click is there's the type of people in you know in every big studio like we were very corporate at this point and in at, at riot but whenever the the people that didn't care so much and had no idea how big that was. Um, once we started getting a lot of people and a lot of cooks in the kitchen and everybody wanted to be a part of it, um, that was an indicator that we were on the right track because some of these people, their talents aren't very much like, they're, they're outside of game development, they're outside of art, they're outside of narrative, they're outside of the creative space, but their job is to look at business opportunities and then look at, um you know unique opportunities and their job is to look at the industry as a whole and say wow that that looks great and and they have that as a talent and those talented people that have really nothing to do with development of stuff they start looking at it and say i see the potential now and you see them the massive amount of interest Mm -hmm. within those individuals and um sometimes they're at you know like they they try to control it and they try to navigate it and they try to make it their own Mm -hmm. but you know, in the long run, that was hard to navigate around them. But that's when I knew um, that we did something that was worth it. And then the other one was, um, and I think like Brandon Beck at Riot, one of the, one of the co-founders, um, I think that he is very creative. And I think that he has a passion for what we were doing. And he was always super supportive and part of the development of some of this stuff. He was hands-on. And so I, I think like he saw it. And when, when we just kind of looked at it in that sense and the way he would present it to the, to the studio every year to like studio wide. Um, and we had like 19 studios worldwide and he would, he would send it out to everybody. Um, and you know, every year you would have like, you know, a keynote kind of like speech, right. 
for three years in a row, mm -hmm. the world building stuff was part of the keynote and leading the keynote. And he knew, and he had that vision right off mm -hmm. the bat that this was the future of, of, of Riot and League of Legends and stuff like that. And so I think those are the moments where like having him really put all of his efforts and, and saying, this is, this is worth focusing on, um, is also when we knew we started putting something together that clicked. Um, but for me, without looking at all those other th things, it's when, um, and it's, and to me, it's always really simple and it makes me smile when I think about it is, is when, um, the champion team that made any character that made whatever they want to make, they looked at it and they said, oh, that's not Bilgewater ish because now we know what Bilgewater is. And so these characters don't fit that. So we're trying to build a Bilgewater character, but that doesn't mm. make sense. And then they would come to us and we would kind of like consult them into like, hey, here's what Bilgewater is. And they would go back and try to like make it more Bilgewater. And then a lot of the new champions, all of them, and they didn't have to write, you know, they're, they're, they were always trying to separate away from us when they started like combining thoughts and sharing ideas and and they were throwing stuff over and we were like sharing and we we're using it and, and all of a sudden it was a collaboration um that's when i knew it was huge because now what i think is the big biggest deal is is league of legends was now wanting like the people that were part of it and developing it at the time um because i had stepped away a little bit um to build the world but like they were like no this is all one we we want to start building out of that um, that's when, that's immediately when I knew, wow, even League of Legends is on board and wants to keep, be part of Runeterra. Um, cause I always thought they were going to be resistant of that. And they were going to say, no, we're the Kings or, or there's a version of that where League of Legends was always more important than Runeterra. And I can see people fighting tooth and nail for the rest of their lives for that. But we changed a lot of hearts and minds along the way. And I thought that <laughs> I thought for, to me, that was more important than anything else, no, than any person. I, I, Brandon Beck yeah. is awesome. And I, and I really love his vision and, and how he kind of treated us on the world building team. But I think I found more mm -hmm. uh, endearing that we knew we delivered something when the team itself on the, on, on, on League of Legends uh, did it. Um, the number two is when we did a test, um, a test, uh, showing of, of a lot of the world building stuff to our players. And that was the most scariest moment ever because we could get shut down right. If they were like, this is crap, this is not League of Legends, this is not the world, I'm tired of all this, like lore, shut it all down. If our players said that, it would be over right there and then. Um, but hmm. honestly, that to me, um, to me was one of the most the biggest achievements I've ever had in and on league. Um, when I, when I got back a big giant list and said, go to this link. And then our players were like, Oh my God, loved it. And not hardly. In fact, it was really difficult to find any kind of criticism, any kind of negativity. It was all a hundred percent positive. And, and those combinations, all those things, we knew we clicked and we made something and it was like full steam ahead. And then the big indicators is when, you know, Tencent owns Riot and Tencent shows up and it's like IP, let's focus on IP and, and everything started clicking. And, <laughs> and then you see all the games and I'll see all the R and D stuff and everything kind of started wrapping around the IP because it was the right thing to do. And, and there's huge potential in the world um, now uh, than before the world building stuff was there and before the Runeterra was, was a thing. Um, so I think that's the moment we realized that we made an IP because people saw beyond one product. People saw multiple products, multiple stories. We have novels being built. We have comic books being built. We have a TV series and other stuff that um, I can't say that I, I know that they were working on uh, when I left. <laughs> and so like, there's just all sorts of avenues they can go in and it won't be redundant and it won't be tiresome because there's yeah. so many things that you can tell stories about in that world. Mm finally putting that s in riot games to actually. yes yeah that s and is now that functional. must have been like the ultimate validation and vindication <laughs> though for your uh for what you believe in um i think it was important and i think people still don't see me like they didn't see me as a game developer and i i i, I kind of like it hurt when people would say that um but 
you know, people are building games out of that stuff and going back in into game development and going out of game development uh, to do a little bit of world building. I like both. And so now I can always say that I can do both now. Um, doing that is a validation of how important it is. And mm-hmm. now going back to the trenches and being an art director and making a game also shows that you can't tell a story if there's nothing that people go to. It's like you can, I think people show up to yeah. games and then if games have great stories, it just enhances it and makes it better. Um, and so I think it needs both. And one is not, nobody's, one is not more important than the other, but I think with with both of them being respected equally and being used strategically, we can have better experiences and which is really what I want. I don't care about world building. I don't care about games. I care about amazing experiences that are interactive. Um, yeah. And that is what I'm, I strive for. And, and so like, I don't want to pigeonhole myself in one, but I'm so happy that I can do both. Mm, definitely. Mm. I really do think that stories are what um, really endear someone towards a certain game. And stories, I do think, is a medium where we communicate a lot of our ideas, what we believe in, and all of those things um, are actually what I think really stick to a player long after that they finish playing a game. Yeah. I think it's memorable. For sure. So it's... It's a conversation mm. piece outside the game with a good story. You can talk about the characters. You can talk about the sequence. You can talk about yeah. what happened. Um, and and then as you talk about them and with your friends and share the the experiences you had, that if they're story-based, they kind of get stuck in your head. It's almost like if somebody tells you a story yeah. about an event in history, you remember it. But if they just tell you in general, it's harder to remember. Mm, the facts. Yeah. yeah. So we're built to retain information through stories. And so when somebody tells you a good story, you you hold it longer and you love it for a longer period of time. And and, and it just becomes iconic over time in your memories. And and I think I think that's beautiful. Mm. Mm, I agree I with that. That's kind of why like fairy tales still yeah. exist or <laughs> you know. Yeah. And I think that's just how we've communicated ideas and our beliefs uh, or how our ancestors have done it for thousands and thousands of years. And it's just that now we're getting, you know, a much more high fidelity visual pass over it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oops, sorry about that. Let me get my... One thing, I am, uh, one thing I am curious is that since we've been talking a lot about the general concepts of how you've been approaching the world building... Mm-hmm. Um, I'm one thing I do want to ask you is that out of all of the things that you design for the League of Legends world building, is there a specific part of the world that you're most proud of? And how did you actually develop that idea from the start to finish? Like the steps and maybe some of the trial and errors that you went through along the way as well. Um, simple. I, I think it's very simple. I think the void... Um, is the the one that I think was the most difficult and and it was one that was extremely controversial in terms of what it is and it had so many avenues to fail in and uh, just to just to explain a little bit more of that um, but but let me first say, Nothing in the world building was done by one person. Um, and mm-hmm. it's going to evolve over time. Even as like we planted the seed, it's going to change and evolve. And you're not going to recognize what we did. Um, but but I know that, um, you know, early on, we had a bunch of developers. I think the world building team is going to evolve into more of like a production team because they're going to now have to, they're going to have to design less and execute on more of it and, and describe more details in it. Um, so that's the transition. But when when you talk about the void, I, it was the first one that we started. Um, and I'll tell you why the void was was so difficult. Um, because I was part of making some void creature, uh, void characters. And um, to be honest, we made one 
uh, Malzahar, one, one, <laughs> one, one void tainted, you know, champion, and it's like, okay, well, that's what the void is. And then we made another champion that was like the void, but nobody ever explained what the void was. So every time somebody created <laughs> a character that made no sense, but it was just cool, and they're like, I don't know, what is it? Is it Demacia? Is it, uh, you know, like Demacia is like Arthurian, you know, royal kind of like, you know, European kind of like. Um, kingdom kind of like feeling right. like it's Arthurian and then you've got you know like other you know like pirates which was a bilgewater and so like you can categorize them in something like that but when you created something where mm -hmm. like I don't know is that like uh, I know that we had this one girl that was based off of a raver you know like raving parties or you know rave um, and it, she, she had some glowing <laughs> yeah. sticks and stuff yeah. like that and then nobody understood who she was we never shipped it by the way but we never understood what what she, what she was, <laughs> and you're like, oh, I don't know what she is. So if we didn't understand it, we threw it in the void category. But every <laughs> void creature was at some point unexplainable. So we're like, I don't know how to explain it. Put it in the void, you know, basket. <laughs> and so over time, our players said, "What is the void?" and and their favorite champion <laughs> was the void. But every everything looks so different that nobody knew what the void was. And so going into it, it's like <laughs> Void could be like the the terrain, uh, like the Zergling kind of like look. Um, right. There's all sorts of like, uh, like um, Games Workshop had like a Cthulhu kind of, Cthulhu-ish kind of style. Like Void, some Void creatures are like that. I know that like um, some, some Void creatures are just like sleek and futuristic and purple. And then bugs like anything that had a bug carapace kind of like and we throw that into the void so the people are like no all of our all of our <laughs> all of our bug creatures so like the void is a bug it's a uh, purple and so like it was just these basic all out of control kind of like descriptions and so we're like what is the sorry i don't know if we're supposed to cuss but like what is the void we couldn't even answer that question we had no idea because it was just a big pile of like lost champions that nobody could describe so we had to like we had to like grab all of that figure out what they're all kind of saying what they have in common and we say purple purple is they have in common purple so we we kept that and we kept these kind of like carapace kind of like layers okay we can like outer shell our outer armor okay keep that um and then everything else we kind of I, I'll, I'll tell you now because I think it's safe. We kind of just threw away everything else, and it pissed off certain uh, people. And that were that made a champion that was they were trying to like make that the void or something like that. It's like um, there were so many avenues mm -hmm. that people thought that, like everybody had a version of their void, and and we when we decided on one that alienated everybody else. So we're like, oh my god, if this is happening oh, yeah. at Riot, imagine when we release our first void stuff and then all of our players are like f you that's not the void and that one was the one that was the most worrisome so when we did the first version um we failed and everybody's like that's just crap and then we did another version and then um, i think i did the i did the first version and it was crap i tried it again and it was crap i put it away um and we put it away for a year so we started the first year tried it for like six months couldn't solve it so we started somewhere else and we started solving those other a year later mm -hmm. we tried it again with somebody else um uh, i think uh macy or uh trevor claxton at the time was at the team and he, oh, yeah. he was trying to hit and we're, we're like and his versions were awesome by the way but like the point that i'm saying is that everybody hit it and they're like nope that's not it so it went into hibernation for two years because Everybody, like we just talked to everybody, we're trying to figure it out and just nothing while we were building everything else. And now we had everything kind of solved like three years later, four years later. And we're still looking at the void and, and we're not even close to like understanding it. And and that's, <laughs> and, and then I finally went back to it. My, no, I, I, I think Macy on the team started hitting that really hard and she started solving some stuff and, and I know that we were like like it was between me and her and we're not showing the teams a lot because we wanted to really try some stuff and put it together and she was doing a great job of like writing these huge lore stuff we had the narrative writer started kind of like describing what it could be 
we we went to Cthulhu and we came back from Cthulhu and um and we're like no we got to make it unique we got to make it ours and uh we ended up starting to kind of borrow from some things but then we transformed them into this one unique thing and honestly narratively we figured out what the void was like written words were like really cool the struggle is now trying to stay away from everything that was like part of that kind of look um and so then i then i then i hired um a, an amazing uh, i work with an amazing artist uh patrick fallwer he like he's amazing like it, it, pretty much if you've seen uh-huh. if you've seen any fantasy movies like um got every fantasy movie he's probably worked on the film um so patrick fallwer uh designed lamborghinis he worked on the hobbit <laughs> He worked on Lord of the Rings. Like, I, I don't even know what, but he's pretty much worked on movies that I would, you know, like drool over. He's probably working on every uh, Netflix or whatever TV series are coming out. He's just amazing. Um, and then me and him just kind of like piled on top of the visuals. And and at the end of the stretch was us started to come together and figure it out. And people mm. everywhere started liking it and nobody was rejecting it even the people that had their own version of mm-hmm. void and they're like no that that's actually better um and then when the players saw the new void and they loved it that one was the hardest because it was so it was so not developed and people made up their own thing in their own head as to what it was and this was completely different it was probably the most unique mm. uh world that we built um and and honestly here's the cool thing mm. everything about the void is explained and i don't ever i don't ever want to tell you how much of it is explained because it needs to be told in a story like how they develop <laughs> the pace and the rapid transformations the, the how how big can it get how powerful can it get uh what its true power capabilities is it like is it is it is it something that swallows up cities is it something that swallows up continents is it something that can swallow up the world is it something that's galactical like mm-hmm. like universal like like can it swallow up universes like how big is this thing and we we kind of went that far and really understood it to its molecular core um <laughs> and that's why i think it's special it's the one that we went way too far and too deep and some people may argue we went too specific um but i think it i think it's going to be one of the better like stories now if if they ever make um now i don't want to give too much away but if they i think i think that could be an amazing story that i'll leave it at that and, and really <laughs> really interesting unique everything that we talked about like how to stay unique how to be a a cog how to make your visuals a cog in the overall story and how to add function into it and purpose and you know the why's and the who's and the hows are all explained um that that one has the most potential. Um and I know that Demacia ends up being mm. the second but because it was so tro- tropey that it ended up being the song but like I think the void the void story is going to be way mm-hmm. way way beyond that but it's so complicated I think nobody wants to touch it cuz it's going to require somebody with real skills to tell that story. Um <laughs> and I and I know that we have narrative individuals that are working on it and I, at Riot and they're amazing. Um, but in, I'm talking about like mm-hmm. film-wise or, or, or long-term storytelling, um, somebody that can then then bring it to life, um, not just describe it and tell tell the long like like tell and describe it the story as we go. It's more of like how do you make it feel like you just you just experienced it. Um, when somebody does that, it's going to be amazing. Sorry. Now you've got me really curious to learn <laughs> more about it myself. <laughs> well, I I I've posted some links on the chat to the 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 Void yeah. region. Mm-hmm. Like the Riot Games has this dedicated website for yeah. the universe, right? Mm-hmm. And I posted a link to the Void. Yeah. Riot, I think it's universe or universe.legallegends.com and then click on the yeah. regions and then yep. you'll see you'll see all of the little yeah. worlds that we kind of developed. I've actually been wondering who's been doing some of the uh, the designs for the world building because 
to me they're some of the most inspirational world building images that i've seen like i've even just yeah. saved them in a folder mm -hmm. on my computer to look at every once in a while as like the benchmark of what i really want to aim for so it's really cool just to be able to you know yeah first of all have a chat with you and also put a, a name to the art that i've been admiring for quite of yeah. quite some time now Oh, well, uh, no, it, it, I, I leave a lot of the credit to the team. Uh, you know, Macy, um, Trevor Claxton was a huge part of that. June on was, yeah. uh, was instrumental. Um, you know, I like, I know that there's some new individuals that came in at the end. And I think a lot of that stuff was, was, was already kind of like yeah. solved and they were kind of like taking it to the next level. But like the, the early, the early dudes like Dan, um, Oh my God, Dan was Dan Norton is is absolutely amazing. Um, I'm a huge fan of his. Um, like I don't want to leave anybody out. Um, obviously, you guys know Eric Canetti. Yeah. yeah. Oh, if, yes. if you know Eric Canetti, he's he's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, he he is one of the he is like he, I didn't know how creative he was, and I don't think he knew it either. When I when I got him onto the team is for 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 because I was a fan of his art <laughs> um, and and his stuff is really <laughs> just like he had a style to his personal personal art and um, I loved everything that he did but I don't know if I saw a lot of like world building abilities in there but the minute he got on our team he was a he's a bigger world builder than I am um, so like you got Eric Kinetic wow. kicking ass. That's you got a really Dan high Warren. compliment from you. No, 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 no. Like I, I think he, he, I, you, you just have to see his stuff. You have to, you have to sit there and develop with him, and you'll, you'll realize he, Mount Targon, what he did with Mount Targon was, holy crap! Like, in fact, it was so way out there. We, he had to stop explaining where he got the idea because it made no sense. It, he made, <laughs> he made, he invented a lot of the Mount Targon stuff because he described a solar baby. Imagine a power so powerful that it can destroy, you know, universes, right? But mm -hmm. the thing that you're ta you're describing is so powerful, isn't even grown up yet. It's a babe. It's a it's some kind of alien baby's mind, infancy. So imagine when that thing grows up. You know, like right now, as in, as his infancy, that thing is so powerful it could destroy all of Runeterra. Um, and I I know that we ended up not going in that direction, but like that's where all of that stuff started. And I just like, how did you come up with that? That's just so stupid and so amazing at the same time. <laughs> and all the stuff that fell off of that and connected to that was just like, holy! I would have never thought of that. He really went into the deep, dark ambiguous world of world building and anybody and everybody could lose their mind and and not get anything out of that and he, he went he went so deep it's scary because they're like everybody just rejected like what the what did you just say even the world building team said what the you know that's how far he went <laughs> and so he is uh he is he is by far like extremely amazing and and, and june was a lot of the um, the executor he he made some f amazing art um and he made a lot of that stuff look really cool but at the end of the day like the last mm -hmm. few years he he started becoming a really world builder and and he's officially i think amazing world builder uh and i think he mm -hmm. i think i'm jealous of him because he can he can make something absolutely gorgeous and refine it down to the very last pixel and now he's a world builder. So like he he is way stronger than than I am at at, <laughs> at, at at executing on that. So he's he's you know the team grew and you know Macy um, has always told great stories and she writes things down. But now she's putting them together and I think she has a better understanding of world building than anybody on the team. She can organize and create arcs and build um, reasoning and 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 function into everything. So that's her superpower. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I handpicked mm -hmm. a lot of these guys because they had the ability to do that. Um, and, you know, it just it just turned out to be 
the best thing that we ever did. Um, you know, like just working with those guys. So when I, whenever I say, you know, yeah, I, I, I built the team, I co-founded the, 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 the world building team. Um, but it was like a lot of efforts and that's just the visual side of things. You got, um, you know, you got some amazing narrative individuals that came in there and just kicked, kicked amazing ass. So we let's, let's not forget that without them, we would not have the consistency, the clarity, and the storytelling um, that goes along with visualizing these worlds. Um, so, you know, mm-hmm. like, definitely, just, it's very inspiring and aspirational yeah. to hear all of these stories. Yeah. Sure. So, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that because well, I know that I've been rambling, but yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go no, ahead. No, I'm done. I'm <laughs> done. I, I think I, I'm, I'm done talking because uh, I hope that was enough and everybody got a, uh, a good story out of that. Uh, and I hope that I didn't bore them. Yeah. <laughs> Not well, all. we've definitely learned a lot. I can't believe it's been an hour and 40 minutes since we've started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And yeah, yeah I think a lot awesome. of people are finding the talk to be very engaging as well. Like some of the comments, yeah. it's like nothing was boring. And another one says, I could listen all day, dude. Oh, that's and awesome. Same. And lots of people echoing similar thoughts. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And as sleepy as awesome. I am right now, it's like blowing my mind too. It's like there's so much that I have to work on myself. Just knowing that there's this <laughs> kind of like next level to to aspire towards for sure well in any case i think we should move on to the q a session Mm -hmm. like we'll open it for 10 minutes and then we'll end the episode afterwards so yeah let's open the q a session and we've already have a few questions Mm -hmm. on from the chat yes there's one that was asked a while back and this one's by yanazi and this and the comment reads hey guys was wondering if you guys could recall your top influential artists that helped you to be able to draw the human form p.s love the podcast oh the human form Mm -hmm. um gary myers back in art center um uh he just taught me how to do the human form he you go to his class every one of your drawings, he will draw over them and you'll find out how crappy your stuff is compared to his. Um, <laughs> and over time, the less red marks that he would leave, the more you said you saw the progress. So uh, Gary Myers, uh, Gary Gareth, I'm, I guess there's a theme, Gary Gareth. Uh, um, he was at, uh, how, go ahead. How do, how do you spell his name? I don't or? know. I don't, I don't remember what Gary Myers, uh, he was a teacher <laughs> at our art center, but um, <laughs> Gary Gareth at um, when I went to PCC Pasadena City College, um, he he taught us some stuff. So like there's some good um, individuals that teach you the um, that teach you the like the the proper way of of I guess figure drawing. But it's if if you're doing figure drawing, then you're just copying the form. Um, mm. If you're developing an understanding of the of the human body it's a different mindset um you never want to copy the Mm. the form you want to understand it and they taught you how to understand the form Mm. Mm. right so there is a difference between observational drawing and learning it by constructing the forms yeah you know those guys that go in and they pretty much copy down to the T, the model, and everybody like gathers around them, and they and, and everybody says how cool they are. Right. And then you have these other guys on the other side <laughs> that like grab each muscle and try to normalize it and, and make sense of it. And then they do a version right next to it with just the minimal amount of lines. So like, I will build every yeah. muscle here, and then I will see and I'll understand it, and I will use with three marks. I'm going to make that mm. same look. Um, and it's just it, mm. and those are the people that nobody cared about because it's like. You made three strokes on your paper, but they didn't realize that those three strokes are gold, are gold mine, are amazing. It's so difficult to get those three strokes. While the guy that rendered the heck out of something mm. because he has a photogenic memory and, and, and knows how to kind of like copy the model, 
they got celebrated at the time, but uh, I really focused on the people that were like, I'm studying here, I'm learning. Um, and I will develop ways to simplify this form and say the same thing that this figure is saying. And um, some Gary and, and, and some of those teachers, like they break it down. Um, Aaron Smith um, was another one. Like just, just I, honestly, Art Center had a bunch of great teachers that focused on yeah. learning and developing the subject, not regurgitating what's out there and keeping you yeah. keeping you on your toes in terms of like building out so yeah um those are the guys that kind of i influence so the me. answer is go to arts art center find uh no no find find <laughs> a good figure figure drawing artist that doesn't teach you how to copy <laughs> the model Te that, that has a whole bunch of techniques mm. to help you understand the the, the form so go to a whole bunch Definitely. of them and I can and leave on the first day. If they are, if they're not doing that, if they're not explaining, it, if they don't know how to do that, walk away. <laughs> I think that's sound advice. And there's another question that we've gotten as well from Damas Draws, and he asks, "Do you have any good practices to do to strengthen the concept designer brain?" Um, so I guess yeah. maybe it's to be more creative. Yeah, and I, I've given some examples earlier, you know, um, not looking yeah. at things, yeah. do reverse images and make sure that your your character, or your drawing or anything like that doesn't come back with a Google page full of stuff that looks the same. Um, and so like mm -hmm. you you can do that. But honestly, the, the thing is, is that I, I write down a really mini story and I try to create the main character or try to like figure out what the environment looks like. Um, and just enough information to where like um, it describes a little bit of like enough of the world so that you know the level of power, level of technology. Um, is it human? Is it mm -hmm. alien? Just enough information and then know that you have to be constrained to those and then force yourself to create something new that's not been done. Um, and that's how you that's how you practice creativity that is useful in game studios because then you can be creative and just mm -hmm. invent anything you want and that's still fun and useful but if a studio says hey mm -hmm. we want to make this new thing here's the writer he described this thing can you go in there and do that um you 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 will now be constrained and, and to get a job doing that you need to know how to be constrained or you mm -hmm. have to create under mm -hmm. constraints mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. I hope that answered the question. I agree with yeah. that whole sentiment. Yeah. And then we have another question from Alex A. Neal. His question is, is our style really necessary for being creative or being unique? Or do you suggest to explore every style in the world? Um, it's, it's irrelevant to creativity. Um, so I don't, I, I don't, I personally don't care about style. Um, but if I'm marketing myself, if I need a signature look to myself, because all of a sudden, um, I develop enough of a following and all that stuff, that's going to help you. Like if I was to do a YouTube kind of version of, of, of my portfolio and over time, people just knew me for like, you want to be able to like have people see, um, mm -hmm the like how people i identify you it's kind of like if i'm working on a game we want to do that screenshot test where like we take a screenshot of that game and then plaster it against other games and then people should be able to see oh you know that's league of legends in five seconds like find the the, yeah. the style so if you want people to find you instantly and recognize your art over and over again everywhere um it's for marketing purposes that's that's where that kicks in but usually it doesn't Mm. That's a good answer, I think. And yeah, hopefully that answers your question, Alex. And we have another one. Um, maybe make this one the last one since it's almost 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from Mike Cabbages. <laughs> it's great to listen to you and your stories. A lot of deep insight. My question, what are your thoughts on AI slash machine learning, the potential future for computers to...
wild design ideas and how it may affect um, concept artists. Negative or ways is yes, the they're going to get close. In both positive and they're going to do ways. they're going to do the art center thing. Uh, AI is going to uh, do an algorithm based off of existing art and do its own version of them, and it's pretty much going to be doing what we're doing now. Um, the the positive <laughs> thing is that I think AI, if it ever does it, but in general, I think it's going to be a long time before AI is truly creative and comes up with unique things on its own that are um, aligned to a, a story constraints or, or to a narrative kind of like uh, organized in a narrative way. Mm. So like AI isn't going to be very creative anytime soon. So if you stay on the creative side, you will mm. avoid the, 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 the AI kind of like taking away some of your job. But in general, I think <laughs> We're going to be fine. It's always going to be a helpful tool. Um, the, the positives on AI is, um, this is the way I see AI, um, procedural kind of content and uh, content creation, which is like, hey, technology helping to create most of the art on a particular game or film. Um, that's, 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 that's the procedural part of it. The AI is going to like think of what it needs to build. Procedural is going to be how it builds it in a very efficient way. And what, what's going to happen is is AI is going to do about 60%, 70% of the overall work. And then it's going to give you, it's going to give the creative people, the people that are really going to grab that and take it to the next level. So that mm -hmm. way it's kind of like, it's going to do most of the grunt work that we do uh, as we, as we, develop art and focus only on the creative stuff and then focus only on like refining and, and, and the fun stuff. Right. Um, so mm -hmm. we're going to be doing the fun stuff and the mm -hmm. AI is going to do the grunt work. And so I'm not too worried as long as I have the ability to be creative. <laughs> well, that's hmm. encouraging to hear. <laughs> I may be wrong. They might be more creative than us and we're doomed. Yeah, that's I'm a good point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So... <laughs> no, I, I, th I think you're right yeah. about AI's not being able to do things based on a story constraint. Like they may be able to do wild stuff, things in the the blue sky yeah. phase. Yeah. They can do like really crazy stuff. But once once you start getting into the details, I think it will still need some human touches here and there. You know. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be a positive note to All end right. on. That we'll still so have our that's the last question. <laughs> and <laughs> yes. <laughs> All no. right. No, I so, think I... okay. Do you have any <laughs> last? As, as graceful uh, as everybody is, and, uh, and you know, I think I've said, I've talked enough, them, so. um, and uh, <laughs> I appreciate everybody's uh, kind words. Cool. Yeah. Thanks so much for uh, being with us here and yeah. telling us really and, wonderful stories and of I'm your journey. Also, and, uh, about design and it's also and interesting to think that this is just like the tip of the iceberg. And I'm sure you have so many other stories and experiences that you can even go into much deeper depth with. Every, every, like we all do. Every, every Like every step that we get closer to our goals... Mm -hmm. And sometimes we reach our goals and we realize that those were really humble goals and we need bigger ones. Um, like everything, everybody has a story and everybody that has achieved something mm -hmm. will always tell you it's hard work, it's not giving up. Um, and it's always yeah. getting your head up out of the clouds and being able to like see the big picture every once mm -hmm. in a while. Like don't get stuck always just trying to grind. Even if you're like, oh, I'm going to grind this out, I'm going to have grit, I'm going to get push always take take a step back assess whether it's the right thing for you and then go in but whatever you focus on just don't give up and don't convince yourself out of it either it's like just go with your heart go with your mind and then once you've committed you know you'll be fine and um, and with that mentality you'll you'll achieve a lot of things mm -hmm. yeah for sure and 
I think some people That's are even interested in seeing part advice. two next time. <laughs> so <laughs> I think if you have, if you're free sometime in the future, I'm personally would be really interested in seeing you actually come up with an idea or design live just to see how you apply all the things and concepts that you've been talking about on this podcast. I think that would be really cool, personally. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, we'll we'll think of some stuff, but there there are <laughs> techniques and there are things that we did to kind of develop um, some of the worlds, and um, and 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 it's there's function to them and there's process to them. So like the boring aspect of how to do that mm-hmm. and how beautiful unexpected things come out of that, um, you know, you do have to be strategic and you do have to make sure that you're organized um, because when you go into ambiguous places like mm-hmm. you get to think of anything you can just keep floating away and and, mm-hmm. and, and that's it but like you do you do have oh, to be sure. so organized that you can bring it back to uh something that is useful um so there's there's stuff that we can always mm-hmm. in a in a future session we can break down what i call foundation sheets um and 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 they're all broken that's up nice. into different components that overall keep you honest and describing mm-hmm. a single world Mm-hmm. Oh. 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 Can you can you hear me? Okay. You've gone yes. silent for some reason. Now we're starting to lose the this perfect oh. time. It's probably a good time to like Yeah, yeah. Yeah, end yeah. it before it it gets worse. For sure. So we're just going to be closing this off. So once again, thank you so much Ed for yep. taking your time. Yeah, I, think so. I think it's been a real <laughs> real inspiring talk and yeah we definitely love to have you back on if you're free sometime in the future yeah mm-hmm. for sure we'd love to come back mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. cool awesome so we're finally at the end of the episode uh, thank you so much guys for watching this episode if you find this episode helpful or entertaining please share it with someone else that you think would find find it the same as well it would really help us out in growing our channel and please follow us on instagram and facebook for updates on upcoming content on youtube to watch our previous episodes and of course on twitch to catch future episodes live and we also have a facebook group for our community which you can join through the link in the chat or description of the video on YouTube later. And yeah, that's it. So no see you Thank guys you. on the next right, podcast. Take care, everyone. And thanks so much, Ed. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody.